until the presentation is ready, I would like to thank you, Dr. Bishlawi, for including me in this uh, meeting. Also, I would like to thank the uh, introduction done by uh, TIFF and uh, by this extensive uh, overview that uh, Andrulla has uh, done. I think there are several points on our region that we need to collaborate with uh, TIFF to uh, crystallize it, otherwise it will remain on the paper. So I really would like, I know I'm not sure if Andrulla is listening to us now, to have a forum from us that includes uh, uh, people from the region, Eastern Mediterranean, that can collaborate with them because there are a lot of things that need to be tailored to our region rather than putting statically uh, that should be done. Uh, for sure, we'll always be collaborating. We just finalized the TDT uh, that I was lucky to be part of it, uh, guidelines. The NTDT together with uh, Khalid Musallam also and Maria Capellini will be published uh, soon. So I hope we could form a specific forum with uh, TIFF. So now my presentation would be just an opening uh, uh, presentation after which there will be several other uh, presentations during the uh, uh, meeting regarding specificities of certain topics in thalassemia. So I will not be going through the details. It is just an introductory uh, presentation. My presentation is uh, sponsored by Bristol Myers uh, Squibb. This is my disclaimer. This is my disclosure. So first of all, I would like to start by just reviewing the uh, bet definitions of beta thalassemia from the conventional beta thalassemia phenotypes into the uh, genotype, into the clinical presentation. So as you, most of you used to remember, we used to talk a lot about the genotype beta, beta silent, beta zero, beta plus, beta zero, beta zero. And then this were related to conventional uh, phenotypes like uh, the beta thalassemia silent carrier, the carrier, the thalassemia intermedia, and the beta thalassemia major. And all of these were related into certain clinical uh, presentations from no anemia, no transfusion, to mild anemia, to mild, uh, moderate anemia with splenomegaly, to severe anemia requiring blood transfusion for life, so for survival, uh, the, and this would be called as beta thalassemia major. So these are three different ways looking into uh, thalassemia. And this is from a very good review that we have published in 2021, mid last year, in the New England Journal of Medicine, for especially for the young uh, uh, generation, I would advise you to read this uh, presentation in the New England, which is really very good because it was done 15 years after um, Rahmilevit's presentation in 2005. So it includes all uh, up till 2021. 20, uh, it was written by myself, Khaled Msallam, and Maria Capellini. Until we relate the genotype, phenotype, clinical presentation to transfusion per se, and the definition was related to transfusion. So transfusion requirement is now used to distinguish between the two entities of thalassemia. At one end, you will have the thalassemia minor. At another end, you will have the TDT or the transfusion-dependent thalassemia. These are the group of patients that would, would require uh, uh, blood transfusion continuously to survival, and they are unable to survive without blood transfusion. This is what we used to call thalassemia major. So now we, we call it non-transfusion-dependent uh, thalassemia. It includes beta thalassemia major, severe hemoglobin E beta, and hemoglobin BARTs. Between the minor and the major, or between the minor and the TDT, you will have the group in the middle, which is called the anti-DT, non-transfusion-dependent thalassemia. Non-transfusion-dependent thalassemia is what we used to call thalassemia intermedia. It includes beta thalassemia intermedia, mild to moderate hemoglobin E beta, and hemoglobin H disease. Now, this is a very interesting group of uh, patients, and the role of ineffective erythropoiesis is very clear in this group of patients because some, most of them at a certain time were not transfused, so the morbidities are very clear in the anti-DT. And uh, in the afternoon, 
Dr. Msallam will be talking about ineffective, and this is where you could highlight the morbidities. This is a group of patients that do not require continuous blood transfusion for survival. However, there is a spectrum for uh, the requirement. Sometimes they require for an infection, pregnancy, sometimes for growth where they would require intermittent blood transfusion, and sometimes they require regular blood transfusion, especially as some of you have started this meeting by saying our patients are getting older and some of them are requiring more blood transfusion. So if we forget about TDT and TDT and we look at this spectrum, it is the need of blood transfusion that will uh, that is needed to understand now better the uh, uh, morbidities and of our uh, patients. And this is the whole picture that we have shown in the New England Journal of Medicine, starting from the genotype, conventional phenotype, clinical presentation, and transfusion requirement. So when you look at the transfusion requirement, required for life, in between occasional or sometimes uh, frequent. And this is the, a major difference between the TDT and the NTDT. Now, after all of this, we thought that some of our NTDT might become a TDT at a certain time in uh, life. But if we forget about the definition, some of the non-transfusion where they did not require at a certain time blood in their life might require at a certain time life. So we wrote this uh, uh, short uh, editorial in the American Journal of Medicine showing that an NTDT sometimes do not require blood, sometimes occasional, sometimes frequent. But once they are require blood uh, frequent, they become like a neo-TDT. Yani so these patients cannot be included in any study on NTDT. This cannot be included in any of the novel therapies because they are acting like TDT now. So one should be careful when defining these diseases and when producing uh, data. You cannot do something on TDT, masalan, with a prehemoglobin of 5 because you are not doing what needed for this patient. And this is why we looked into this a new terminology, and this new terminology is really important for the clinical, uh, for choice of uh, clinical uh, trials. Also, this is an interesting uh, paper. So let us talk now about the uh, current status and the unmet needs in uh, TDT. We all know that the introduction of uh, transfusion improved survival in TDT. And this is very clear and well known to all of us. This is an old uh, study, but however, it shows you uh, patients who left untreated would die within a uh, few years. And we all know now the survival. Some of you have mentioned in the introduction that the survival is reaching 60. We have patients at the age of 60 and even 70 now with uh, thalassemia. And I'm sure it will be more and more, especially with those uh, children that are well chelated and well transfused and moving more and more into adolescent and adulthood. But transfusion has standards. And as uh, Andrulla presented, we, use, we, we need to uh, look into these uh, standards. And we need to keep the prehemoglobin level of our patient at 9, 9.5, 10, sometimes 10.5. And with all my visits to a lot of uh, areas, specifically in our areas, sometimes the prehemoglobin level is low. So we are under the uh, standards of uh, therapies. And also, this is what I was saying, that there is also a lot of regional variation in transfusion practices in TDT, and they continue to uh, exist, driven the availability, the distances to reach the center, availability of uh, centers in the areas of these individuals, uh, availability of uh, blood banks uh, for the whole uh, region. So there is a lot of variation in transfusion and specific in, in the region and in the nation it, uh, itself. This is something that we need to work uh, on. And as we know that transfusion will increase the healthcare resource utilization. So transfused patients had significantly more all-cause health care resource utilization and iron chelation therapy compared to non-transfusion patients during a follow-up. And those patients 
will have a risk of liver, endocrine, cardiac, and renal complication, were significantly higher and positively correlated with their blood cell transfusion. So we know that this is an unmet need. Patients need transfusion to keep it at a certain hemoglobin uh, level. Availability of blood is an uh, issue. Safety of blood is still an issue in some parts of, uh, of our region. This would lead to iron overload, and these are really important unmet uh, needs. And even transfusion has a lot of uh, uh, complications. Now, we, most of it is infection, aluminization, and we know that iron overload is an important uh, complication of uh, transfusion. Alloimmunization is an important uh, issue, specifically when we don't transfuse our patients regularly or specifically in anti-DT patients. It is a major uh, problem. So we need to transfuse. We need good uh, transfusion. We, need, uh, we know that transfusion will improve the survival. However, it comes at a, a cost. So transfusional iron overload become uh, became the key driver for morbidity of TTT. This is also a nice uh, slide that we have used in the New England Journal of Medicine. It is really very simple uh, slide, but it describes all what we will be talking to in this coming two days. So for starting from an alpha to beta chain imbalance, which is the most important pathophysiology of our patients, this would lead to what we call ineffective erythropoiesis, abnormal erythropoiesis within the bone marrow. That would lead to hemolysis. Hemolysis would lead, as we will see in the other presentation, hypercoagulability and anemia. Anemia would lead to increased iron absorption, which is the primary iron overload. And when you transfuse, you will get secondary iron overload. So each step of this is a marker for novel therapy now. Starting from gene therapy, to lospatorcep, metapivit for ineffective erythropoiesis, to other, uh, 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 other uh, novel therapies that affect the modulation of uh, hemoglobin. So each step here is, is, is a target for some of the novel therapies. If you look into the uh, red line, you would see that uh, this will worsen. So the, if there is an imbalance, there is ineffective erythropoiesis, hemolysis, and worsening. What will ameliorate all of this is blood transfusion. Uh, this is the blue line. So when you transfuse your patients, you ameliorate or you remove ineffective erythropoiesis, and you will not see all the complications that you see in ineffective uh, erythropoiesis. So because of blood transfusion, as you all expect, patients will get iron overload, and iron overload is mostly in the liver, heart, and in the endocrine organs, yet also can be seen in sev uh, everywhere. And this is usually measured by an MRI, either a T2-star MRI or an uh, uh, Ferris scan, R2 MRI, and we know by now that we have very good data correlating the liver biopsy to the MRI. As Androlla stated also, we need to standardize our MRIs, specifically in the region and in the nation, and it should be accessible to most of our patients, because now we could do an MRI of the liver, which correlates very well with the total body iron, MRI of the heart and other uh, organs. Now, the thresholds in thalassemia TDT is a little bit high, and this is from the time of Olivieri, and they need to be uh, revisited. Because if you look at the LIC here, it is 7 and uh, more than 15. Seven, more than 7 is associated with liver disease, more than 15 with cardiac and a lot of morbidities. Now, these numbers are st high. What we aim at now from all of the clinical studies is to have an LIC of three and below. These are unacceptable, and this needs to be revisited uh, soon. While for the heart, the T2 star of the heart, more than 20, no iron overload, less than 20 iron overload, and less than 10 iron overload associated with arrhythmias and heart uh, failure. So these are important thresholds, and later I'll tell you the thresholds of the uh, anti-DT. This is from the TIF guidelines, 2022, how frequently we should do a serum ferritin, a liver iron concentration, T2 star of the heart. Yet, I always say that we come from a region where a lot of these uh, machines are not available. Always keep in mind the importance of serum ferritin, and keep in mind that serum ferritin is an acute phase reactant, 
and can uh, um, uh, go up and down. So one should look at it critically and do a trend of uh, serum uh, ferritin. This is why, together with my colleague Viprakasid from Thailand, we try always to look and to adapt all these uh, guidelines to guidelines that are adapted to resource-limited uh, 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 settings. So if MRI is available, do it for everyone. If it is not available, you use seroferritin. If it's available but with limited quantity, uh, try to identify who are the patients that will benefit from an MRI, and we can keep this for the discussion. And this is for the liver and for the heart, because in TDT, both liver and the heart MRI are important, unlike NTDT. So with time, and we know that this uh, causes the iron overload a lot of complication, there has been an evolution of iron chelation therapy. So this is only an introductory slide. I, sh I think Dr. Amal Bishlawi will be talking about chelation, the, uh, the spectrum of chelation uh, therapy. So from uh, subcutaneous, intramuscular, intravenous, to oral dispersible, uh, uh, to oral tablet, to oral dispersible form, to oral uh, form, which is film coated uh, form, to the novel therapies now, where will we tailor, uh, tailor directly to the iron uh, regulation. This is the Eclipse study, which is on the film-coated uh, tablet that was done on adult patients using film-coated Deferazirox, through which the FDA approved the uh, Jade New as the modality of treatment. I, I showed you this slide, and this slide is from the secondary outcome, not the primary outcome. The primary outcome was safety, but showing you when it is given as a tablet, not as in a dispersible form, the adherence was better, the satisfaction and the preference were better in this group of patients. This is the Eclipse study. This is the first time we show this uh, slide, which is called the MIMAS uh, study, and this shows also a collaboration in the region. And uh, Dr. Yasser Wali uh, headed this paper that was published a few days ago in the American Journal of uh, Hematology, where we tried to use the uh, Jade New for pediatric patients in a crushed form. And it was crushed and uh, given, and it shows also that it can be given, and this is also for registry because the drug is registered, the study was done only on adult uh, patient. For sure, blood transfusion improved the survival, decreased mortality and uh, morbidity. Iron chelation therapy also did the same, but the presence of MRI has changed also the history in uh, thalassemia. And Together, when the MRI was available specifically for the liver and the heart, we were able to witness or to see ahead, specifically in the heart, what might happen in the patients. And we rarely see now patients going with heart failure directly to the emergency room. So the MRI also is a very important element in the progress for our patients. And I'm sure you have heard that Andrulla has specifically talked about the MRI and having it standardized in our uh, region. Yet, iron overload remains to be a concern despite all the chelation uh, uh, therapy and there is variation between the East and West and uh, the Middle East where a large number of our patients, Middle East and uh, North Africa, still have iron overload in the liver and the heart. And what are additional challenges with transfusion and iron chelation therapy? This will add to the unmet needs and increase the burden on treatment, limited access, suboptimal use, cost, resource utilization, convenience and adherence, lack of efficacy and adverse uh, events. So now with all of this in TDT, we've seen that the trends of mortality and morbidity are changing. And we look, if we look into Greece, Cyprus, and uh, Thailand, you would see that the heart is not anymore the most important cause of uh, death in these patients. And we're moving more into malignancy like hepatocellular carcinoma, infection disease, thrombosis, and other morbidities. And here also, I would like to start to have some data from our region looking into causes of mortality and morbidity in this group of patients. This is a nice slide that we have uh, published in How I Treat in Blood, and it is on how I treat thalassemia that are getting older, or adult thalassemia, showing you that the problems are not anymore only growth failure, poor development, 
sexual development school, physical image, we are moving more now into other problems like workplace, financial duties, marriage, family, survival stress, looking into a better quality of life, uh, pregnancy. So now we need to look into all these issues in our patients and the whole purpose is not to increase survival, but to improve survival and quality of life. This is why we will be, this is why we will be talking about quality of life. These are some of the papers and the uh, guidelines. Briefly, NTDT, because uh, Dr. Msallam will be talking about ineffective, he will tailor the NTDT. So in NTDT, where the patients are not transfused, you see a lot of, uh, you see a lot of uh, complications that are not seen in TDT, specifically silent brain ischemia, pulmonary hypertension, extramedullary leg ulcers. And this is a new study from the Italian group showing that the morbidities also are different. Specifically, you see pulmonary hypertension, no uh, heart failure, hepatic disease, cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. The interaction of uh, all these risk factors, because these are, as I told you, alpha to beta ineffective erythropoiesis. You are not transfusing them, so they will have different morbidities. And this is an interaction between ineffective erythropoiesis, hemolysis, and iron overload. The Talasa study is the study that uh, was approved for chelation therapy in NTDT, and it was published also in um, Blood in 2012. It shows the importance of chelation in this group of patients, even if they are not transfused at all. Also, this, is, this was published a few days ago at the American Journal of uh, Hematology, where it showed the Thetis trial, because the Thalassa was on 20 milligram per kilogram per uh, day for one to two years, and in this study, the Thetis, we uh, increased the dose to 30 milligram of Deferazerox, and it was a five-year uh, study, also asked by the FDA to show further safety and efficacy. So this is a new study that you could look at, and I could share it with you, showing the importance of chelation therapy not only in TDT, but also in NTDT. This is from the TIF guidelines showing you that in NTDT, the thresholds are different. So what we aim at is an LIC less than three, and even less, uh, less than three, because all morbidities are seen at an LIC of five, and a serum ferritin of 800, because all morbidities starts at, so keep LIC three, serum ferritin 300 and your NTDT hopefully will be safe without morbidities. So despite all what I have shown, yet there are limited options and we need further, sorry, and we need to, uh, So I tried all through this presentation to show you that there are unmet needs, whether in TDT or in NTDT. In TDT, blood transfusion is a major issue. Chelation therapy is a major issue. In NTDT, we need to increase their hemoglobin, and better if we increase their hemoglobin without being transfused. And this is how I will end my presentation, by showing that with all these unmet needs that, uh, that we uh, have, we, need, we have a lot of uh, a new menu to use for our patients and to include them in some of the clinical trials. Some of these are not anymore clinical trials. This is a nice uh, review done with uh, uh, the four of us, Ryan, Khaled, myself, and Dr. Capellini, where we looked into what I've showed you at the beginning, the pathophysiology, alpha to beta abnormalities, gene editing, gene therapy, Targeting ineffective erythropoiesis, losbatorcept and metapivit. Losbatorcept is approved for TDT, and uh, Khalid will be talking about, and uh, targeting iron regulation, like the hepcidin trials, where we are doing around four to five trials on this uh, part. So I tried as much as possible to show you the landscape of thalassemia in hopefully 20, 30 minutes, and we will go through the details all this uh, day and tomorrow and we can answer a lot of your questions. Thank you.